heavily contested issue has managed to sneak its way into our public and political dialogue yet again. The topic was thrusted upon us after the Reproductive Health Care Act was enacted in New York on June 22, 2019. The bill, after passing in the New York Assembly, made its way to the New York State Senate to then end up on the desk of the New York governor. This abortion bill is heavily controversial and seems to be destroying the middle ground that could have been reached by the self-acclaimed pro-life crowd and the self-acclaimed pro-choice crowd. The bill named A21 in the Assembly and S240 in the Senate states that comprehensive reproductive health care, including contraception and abortion, is a fundamental component of the woman's health, privacy, and equality. The New York Constitution and the United States Constitution protects a woman's fundamental right to access safe legal abortion. The legislator finds, as with other medical procedures, the safety of abortion is furthered by evidence-based practices developed and supported by medical professionals. Abortion is one of the safest medical procedures performed in the United States. The goal of medical regulation should be to improve the quality and available of healthcare services. It is the intent of the legislature to prevent the enforcement of laws or regulations that are not in furtherance of a legitimate state interest in protecting a woman's health that burden abortion access. Every individual who becomes pregnant has the fundamental right to choose to carry the pregnancy to term, to give birth to a child, or to have an abortion pursuant to this article. A healthcare practitioner licensed, certified, or authorized under Title VIII of the Education Law, acting within his or her lawful scope of practice, may perform an abortion when, according to the practitioner's reasonable and good faith professional judgment, based on the facts of the patient's case, the patient is within 24 weeks from the commencement of pregnancy, or there is an absence of fetal viability, or the abortion is necessary to protect the patient's life or health. The controversy from this bill is the language in the bill, seemingly indicating that the legislator is doubling down on abortion being considered a medical procedure. Not only does the bill declare abortion a right, it removes restrictions as well as opens up the time period from the original 24 weeks after conception to the very last minute of birth. Pro-choice activists, as well as other proponents of the bill, argue the bill doesn't give unfeathered access to abortion up until birth. Rather, it opens up the possibility of late-term abortion if the mother's life or health is threatened. However, the an antecedent version of the law, which is now overturned, had more punishments for late-term abortions. So not only does this bill effectively change or render the previous penalties null, it ultimately leaves the decision of whether or not an abortion is legal to the medical provider doing the abortion procedure without limit within the first 24 weeks, but after that, if it affects the mother's life or health. Where pro-life activists take issue is the discretion and legal freedom that the medical provider can make the decision to carry out an abortion based on the facts of the individual case falling within the parameters already listed above. There doesn't seem to be an objective standard as to what qualifies as something that could negatively affect the mother's health, nor is it limiting what the definition of health is. Health, as defined by the World Health Organization, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. The bibliographic citation for this definition is Preamble to the Constitution of the World Health Organization as adopted by the International Health Conference, New York, 19 June through 22nd July, 1946. 
and mental health as defined by the New York State Organization, National Alliance on Mental Illness, states that mental illnesses are medical conditions that disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. Just as diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas, mental illnesses are medical conditions that often result in diminished capacity for coping with the ordinary demands of life. Therefore, the Reproductive Health Care Act, barring the state from interfering in the decision made between the mother and health professional based on the issue, as long as the decision is made within the first 24-week period, or on life or health reasons, health, not limited to physical, becomes a lot more broad rather than limiting. And that is the way the bill was intended to be. As a result of this bill at eight months, a mother and healthcare professional can claim that the baby is detrimental to the mother's health, which as I explained, is not limited to physical. Mental health falls into this category. And mental health resulting from this bill is whatever the healthcare professional and mother define it as. Believe it or not, I wasn't planning on this video being a review of the New York Reproductive Healthcare Act. I was planning on talking about abortion. I wanted to talk about the moral implications of abortion and discuss whether or not abortion is morally wrong or if it is even justifiable. Abortion, simply put, is putting a stop to a pregnancy. The common dictionary definition of abortion is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy, most often performed during the first 28 weeks of pregnancy. There are many reasons for a woman to pursue the procedure of aborting her baby. One might abort a baby from a pregnancy induced by rape. A deformity or disorder can act as a catalyst for abortion. The burden a baby places on finances can exhort a woman or even a couple to seek alleviation through abortion. Oftentimes, the abortion option becomes enticing for girls who are far too young to accept the responsibility. Over the years, I have had various shifting views on abortion. I've been at both extremes on this issue as well as drifting in the moral void between the two extreme stances often taken. Someone very close to me has had a few abortions, so naturally I originally fell on the abortion on demand side of the issue for some time. I was even militant about it. I had no empathy to the side that wanted to ban abortion, nor did I have empathy for the individuals who found it morally reprehensible. I used to espouse the talking points of it being just a bundle of cells and compared the act of abortion to the mere act of exfoliation. I even said at one point that everyone who is anti-abortion is secretly pro-choice once their underage daughter gets pregnant. I loved the talking point thrown around that conservatives are pro-life when the fetus is in the womb, but not when it is outside of the womb, because it's generally accepted that the conservative movement rejects social safety nets. I typically reject welfare, so I thought I was being ideologically consistent by being pro-choice. Nothing was easier than dressing my pro-abortion stance with my libertarian ideals and platitudes and principles like freedom, individualism, and a woman's right to choose. But one day, I was at a book place called Book Warehouse in Seaside, Oregon, which is a few miles away from where I live. I came across this book called Liberty Defined, 50 Essential Issues That Affect Our Freedom, by an author who I was vaguely familiar with and at one point inspired by. That author is Ron Paul, and in his book, in the very first chapter, the bedrock for transforming my opinion was laid. Who is Ron Paul, and why should you care about what he has to say? That's fair enough. Ron Paul is an obstetrician. Ron Paul, a gentle, fatherly old man, has delivered over 4,000 babies throughout his life. Dr. Paul even opened up his own private practice around the business of medicine and surgery centered around and concerned with childbirth and the care of women giving birth. 
Before opening up his own practice, the doctor was a flight surgeon in the United States Air Force. Before earning a doctor of medicine, Dr. Paul earned a bachelor's degree in biology. Not to beef up Ron Paul's resume any more than it already is, he was also a successful congressman, serving for more than three decades in the span of five decades. He is also a three-time presidential candidate. His impressive resume and experience in the medical wheelhouse, as well as my nostalgic memories of him from 2011 and 2012, is more than enough to persuade me to listen to what he has to say. And if that wasn't enough, there's another interesting element to the character that is Ron Paul. He is a libertarian. Why is that significant? Well, it's commonly accepted as well as explicitly stated in the platform of the Libertarian Party that libertarians support a woman's right to choose as well as acknowledging that it is a difficult issue. But Ron Paul, who is a libertarian through and through, takes a different approach. In the first chapter of Liberty Defined, Dr. Paul recounts on one occasion in the 1960s, when abortion was still illegal, I witnessed, while visiting a surgical suite as an OBGYN resident, the abortion of a fetus that weighed approximately two pounds. It was placed in a bucket, crying and struggling to breathe, and the medical personnel pretended not to notice. Soon the crying stopped. This harrowing event forced me to think more seriously about this important issue. The same day in the OB suite, an early, deliberately occurring, and the infant born was only slightly larger than the one that was just aborted. But in this room, everybody did everything conceivable to save this child's life. My conclusion that day was that we were overstepping the bounds of morality by picking and choosing who should live and who should die. These were human lives. There was no consistent moral basis to the value of life under these circumstances. I wasn't being beaten over the head with pictures of babies in the womb. I wasn't being judged. Instead, I was given perspective by someone I respected and considered a distant intellectual mentor. The wool over my eyes had been uncovered. The cold, hard fact that whether or not a baby will make it through the birth canal is a decision that will be made in a table chart fashion that weighs the pros and cons of letting the baby live or die, this wasn't the only smack to the face that the nearly pacifist Dr. Paul delivered to me that day. If you could even call it a smack, it was more akin to being hit by solid brass knuckles manifesting from a righteous self-defense of life. It's interesting to hear the strongest supporters of abortion squirm, when asked if they support the mother's right to an abortion in the ninth month of pregnancy. They inevitably don't support such an act, but every argument that is made for abortion in the first month is applicable to late pregnancy as well. It's still the mother's body. It's still her choice. As someone who had a condescending sense of enlightenment emanating from my mindless and faulty belief of my own ideological consistency, it was the hardest punch to the face I have ever received. I wasn't deserving of my smug attitude because I had no reason to be smug. I still don't. This first chapter forced me to open my damned eyes. However, despite my realization that I'm not intellectually superior, or more consistent than the person sitting next to me, I am still a stubborn individual. It took an amalgamation of pieces that laid the final smackdown to me, which ultimately placed my mind in a different space. I was a fence-sitter resisting intellectual change. I started acknowledging that abortion was almost akin to murder, but I still found myself being an apologist to my previously held position. Do you remember how earlier I said that I described a fetus as a clump of cells? Do you remember how I compared the termination of a clump of cells as akin to exfoliating dead skin? I didn't put that in there for no good reason. I was listening to another pro-life libertarian give a lecture. I can't remember where he was speaking, 
when I was listening and quasi watching, but that's not the important part of the story. Austin Peterson gave a 15 to 20 minute speech about liberty, individualism, private property, free markets, and morality. At the end, he took questions. Someone in the audience asked him to justify his pro-life stance on abortion despite being a libertarian. Austin Peterson began by claiming about how much he appreciates science and the scientific method, then finished it with one important point. If we send a probe to another planet or if we send people and we take samples then proceed to analyze these samples and we find single-celled organisms, the headlines on newspapers and beyond and, and every news article ever, would read about how we have discovered life on another planet beyond our own lonely existence down here on Earth. My mind tricked me into thinking I was the opposite of a science denier. I was fooled into a false sense of consistency. This was a connection that was obvious and it pained me. The possible idea of finding extraterrestrial life on another planet fasc fascinated me to no end. I would have jumped if I saw a headline that read about finding cells beyond our planet. I was ecstatic when I learned that there was water on Mars. This is why it pained me not to make such an obvious connection that was always there in my mind. One of the final nails in the coffin about this issue was my girlfriend at the time. When I met her, she was pro-life. Remember when I said I was militantly pro-abortion? Well, she was one of the ones I was militant toward. I berated her about a woman's right to choose, but she was seeing a side of it that I wasn't seeing. She was seeing the fetus not as a clump of cells, but rather life with human DNA. An exfoliation of dead skin is just that, the removal of dead cells. An abortion is the removal of a growing and evolving life form with its own unique DNA sequence that says it is human. Being pro-abortion is not being on the side of women.